you had watched, we have this uh, every week. I do a lot of speaking in public and frequently people come up and they want to ask me questions and I would say the majority of the time the person they want to ask about is Robert Spencer and they're so interested in what he has to say and they're interested because outside of the, and this is an important point I believe, there is an establishment, not just in North America but in Europe too, they live in areas where they'll never be touched by crime, uh, by some of the detritus of, of, of the worst kind of multiculturalism. They'll, 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 they'll never be victims they can afford not to be. So they don't know, they, they don't empathize with the rest of people. People are angry out there. Islamic fundamentalism is an issue throughout the world. In the UK, I'm going to show you a video in a few moments. Now, we have bleeped out so much of it because there's a lot of swearing. It's, it's in the north of England where a group of, of young South Asian Muslim teens they punch a girl, and then a fight takes place. If this is a one-off incident, you'd say, well, it's a group of thugs. This has happened time and time again in the UK, in Europe as well, where young Muslim gangs will attack a white girl on the street. We also have, and it's gone on repeatedly, groups not only of teens, but older men too, of Muslim background, who will groom young women, uh, gang rape them, and what I find very intriguing here is many of these men, not all but most of them, have left their faith behind, but the misogyny has continued. And I want to talk about that with Robin in a few moments' time. Let's see that video now, please. I'm so damn angry because this is the sort of area, I'm from the south, not the north, this is where I was brought up. This is not happening to wealthy white liberals sitting there, you know, on the bench of a, of a court or in his lovely house. No, that, it happens to ordinary people who live in ordinary working class areas and it happens throughout the UK now and in France and Belgium and Scandinavia and the chattering classes and the elites will not talk about it because they're frightened physically and they're frightened of being accused of being Islamophobic. I couldn't care less. I couldn't care less. Robert Spencer, please comment on this because I, I suspect a lot of these kids aren't particularly religious anymore, but their hatred and disdain for women and for others, that's what stays with them, it seems, for life. Well, yeah, it's a cultural hangover, Michael. You know, even in most Muslim countries today, Islamic law is not enforced, but still, Christians and other non-Muslim minorities do not have equal rights before the law, not even in uh, still secular Turkey. So the, the fact is that the institutionalized discrimination against non-Muslims remains as a, uh, an aspect of the culture, even when Islamic law is set aside. That's the same kind of thing here. I don't know if these uh, boys are really uh, not religious, as you say, but if not, their contempt for women, their contempt for non-Muslims, uh, that often, all too often, spills over into violence, is something that comes from core teachings of Islam. The Quran calls non-Muslims the most vile of created beings, says that they're, they're unclean, and so on, while the Muslims are the best of people. And it tells the Muslims in the Quran itself, chapter 48, verse 29, to be merciful to one another, but harsh or ruthless to the unbelievers. And so this is the result, and this is the result of disastrous immigration policies that never took any of that into account, that would have branded any kind of exploration of that as racist and Islamophobic and bigoted. And now our uh, people all over the country, innocent people in, in England, as well as, as you pointed out, in Europe, and increasingly in the United States and Canada, are being victimized and are going to be victimized by Islamic supremacists because of these kinds of poor assumptions. 
You know, I, I lived as a young man through the worst of uh, soccer violence <clears throat> in England, and it could be very brutal at times. But th there was a certain strange, perverse, but still moral code of people who were, if you like, civilians. They weren't to be involved. Women were girls who would always hang around, these gangs of, of skinheads and whatever, and there'd be girls on the periphery. They were never attacked. They got some vicarious thrill out of it, but they were, they were never part of it. There were things that you didn't do. People not involved, you, you, you didn't attack. And I'm not saying I was part of it. I certainly wasn't. But it, it's all changing. There was a wonderful book about the British prison population where there's hardly, you hardly ever find a Sikh or a Hindu. So the South Asian population that came to Britain at the same time, Muslim, Hindu, and Sikh, you, you hardly ever find a Hindu or a Sikh in a British prison. The Muslim prison population is massive. And what the man said who wrote the book, he said, most of these people, they're not religious anymore, but they have retained and maintained their misogyny. And they can't even allow uh, women teachers in the class, in the prison with them, because they'll be beaten and raped. Absolutely. And Michael, you know, what you point out about Sikhs and Hindus shows that uh, is, is the common theme in the mainstream media, that opposition to jihad and Islamic supremacism is racist, is completely out of focus and is actually a very highly tendentious propaganda point designed to intimidate people into thinking there's something wrong with resisting jihad and Islamic supremacism. There's nothing racist about opposing an authoritarian, brutal supremacist and misogynist ideology. And that's what we're talking about. Mm. The, the, in the, the UK, as I mentioned, there are the gangs of, uh, they're, they're rape gangs, effectively. They're men who will groom vulnerable, often vulnerable, young white girls from working class communities. Uh, they'll be turned into prostitutes or just gang raped and so on. And this, there, there are dozens of examples, each gang with 5, 10, 15 men. And in, in the British press, they kept using the term Asian, which in the UK means South Asian. There were so many complaints from Hindus and Sikhs and even some responsible Muslims who said, can you stop using this? There is one factor, one aspect which characterizes everyone involved. They are Muslim. They are, don't say Asian. They are Muslim. But, and finally, the media began to change a little, but they still use a euphemism. They can't say Muslims because they don't want to admit that it's a Muslim problem. They certainly don't want to explore the fact that the Quran allows for sex slavery, that Islamic authorities in several countries in recent years have called for Muslims to practice sex slavery, to capture infidel women and use them in this way. And they don't want to point out that that's the justification for this because it would make them have to ask hard questions to the Islamic communities and about their own immigration policies and their own policy towards the Muslim communities in the UK. Mm. And so instead they have to lie about it, pretend that it's an Asian problem, and thereby denigrate the Sikhs and Hindus who are law-abiding citizens and most welcome there. Yeah. You know, we, we had lots of other subjects to talk about, but this, this one has been, been the, the single, and I, won't, I make no apologies for that. What, what stuns me is the, and we spoke about this the other day with Douglas Murray, it's the failure of, of those groups who should be most vociferous on this issue, women, feminist groups, g the gay community. The gay community will, will still complain that, that, I know, the Catholic Church is against same-sex marriage. That is not your fight, my friend. Your fight is against a growing Islamic fundamentalist group who will kill you merely for being gay. These are the people you have to watch for. Feminists, gay community, Jewish liberal groups. They, they are so, I don't know, intimidated by the culture that if they don't start speaking up soon, there'll be no one left to speak for them. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about similar issues tragically, but we will next week because we have to. Thank you so much, my friend. Thank you, Michael. Always a pleasure.